is William Ma, CIO of NOAA Holdings. I'm honored to be your moderator for this, you know, wonderful panel. And um, the title of the panel is Equities, Hopes of Economic Recovery and Stimulus. Um, before the panel start, I would like to, you know, each panelist to give a quick introduction of themselves. Uh, can we start with uh, Kevin? Yeah, thank you, William. Appreciate it. Um, so my name is Kevin Rideout um, from Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Um, so I'm the global head of the client development division. Um, prior to that, I worked uh, at Thomson Financial, now known as Refinitiv, I guess, these days. Um, and after that was DTCC and then many years at Citigroup, both on the custody and on the, uh, and on the trading side. Um, been at the exchange about five years. Um, really overseeing the Stock Connect and the the, uh, the wonderful growth growth of the Westerners into China, um, a lot of client attraction there and building out the ecosystem. And uh, really pleased to be on a journey now as we start uh, our MSCI evolution. Uh, thanks to Dr. Wei and his team at MSCI, um, hoping to make uh, Hong Kong the global center for emerging markets. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. You know, by the way, nice COVID beer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I was told, you know, to make this, you know, fun and insightful panel and I'll try to do my very best. And uh, ne uh, next there's, one... There's uh, a story <laughs> behind the beard, but I'll, uh, I'll save that for another time. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the next um, um, guest would be uh, Sergio. Sergio, can you make an intro on yourself, please? Thank you, William. I'm Sergio Gulo from B3, the Brazilian Exchange and OTC. I'm responsible for international business development and client relations uh, for Europe and Asia. Thank you, Sergio. And um, the next um, guest speaker would be um, Dr. Wei. Thanks, Doctor. Thank you, William. Um, and thanks for the invitation to speak on this um, uh, great panel and great timing. My name is Zheng Wei. I run MSCI's um, Asia um, Index Research Team. So my team and myself are deep, deeply involved um, in providing um, investment solutions based on a number of data and tools and services provided by MSCI. Um, in, in Hong Kong, clearly we are partnering very close with Kevin and his team in exchange um, and very excited to, um, to see the recent trends of liberalizations in China um, and related tools and services that we can provide to investors. So prior to MSCI, I spent um, you know, over 12 years in various investment banks, including JP Morgan, um, Merrill Lynch, and Lehman Brothers. Thank you, Dr. Wei. Last but not least, you know, my long-term you know, old friend, you know, Ancio, he has very long experience you know, in the market. Ancio, over to you. Probably the oldest without a beard here. Um, <laughs> I was educated, I was born in Africa, was educated under von Hayek. I was one of his last students, got my PhD in Freiburg on multinational corporations, was an assistant professor in Germany, then became the chief economist, the chief regional economist for the broking arms of NM Rothschild for the whole region in Asia including China, of course, and then for S.G. Warburg doing the same thing, have written three books, and I'm now a private wealth strategist for high net worth individuals. I would like to, you know, um, you know start our panel today. Again, the, the title, you know, of the panel is Equities, Hope of Economic Re Recovery and Stimulus. And, you know, equities may have obstacles ahead as we go into the geopolitical uncertainties, U.S. election, and possible, you know, second, third, if not fourth wave of COVID. And, you know, these major themes are causing confusion in the marketplace that needed to be, you know, navigated. And recently, the moving of uh, MSCI indices on Asia and emerging market has been topical. And, you know, what will be the implication for the equity market and capital flows are our main themes. And we will divide in the panel into three parts. The first part is talk about the Asia, you know, emerging market equities discussion. And then the second part is, you know, the tools and methodologies in order to implement, you know, our investment bill to the market, given the uncertainty and volatility. The last part is um, the product innovation and future trends, both, both in terms of the tools and the market. And then we'll do a, you know, quick conclusion uh, and summing up. And the last part of it would be, uh, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, you know, uh, Q&A sessions. Uh, Without further ado, um, I would like to start with the first question. The first question is, you know, Asia is leading the recovery, but the gap between the markets 
and the real economy is growing? And where should firms be looking to gain clear signals? How can the market you know, performance be tracked? And to begin with, I would like to you know, address the question to Kevin. Can you give us you know, some view or insight you know, on this topic? Certainly, thank you, um, William. The, um, I suppose I can only really look at the, the observations that we're seeing and, um, and clearly there's a, a huge appetite for, uh, for, uh, for equities um, within our market particularly and, uh, and more so into the Chinese market. Um, the gap, I suppose, is really um, a little bit narrower out here some may say, um, probably due to the fact that, um, you know, we, we enjoyed uh, COVID first and foremost out here and uh, whether it's FIFO or not. But, um, you know, when the, the, the factories went back, we definitely saw a surge in, uh, in volume into, into Chinese equities and particularly into the, the tech sector that uh, has been seen elsewhere in the road um, around the world. Um, but it wasn't just maintained just into into China. I think also Hong Kong um, has uh, has enjoyed quite a quite an inflow of uh, of assets as well. So, um, just generally, the the appetite to put money into equities has been a been a benefit here, and also the fact that you know it's sort of uh, the factories are back and uh, China data seems to be uh, in the positive side. So um, mm. we get to facilitate some of that as an exchange. So that's uh, some of the observations we're seeing. Got it. The stock exchange is doing an excellent job. So um, you know, year to day, just, uh, just a middleman, <laughs> just a middleman. <laughs> and the southbound flow is about fifty. 8 billion US dollars southbound, you know, domestic Chinese investor investing in Hong Kong shares compared to around, you know, 30 billion, you know, previously. So actually year to date has been close to, you know, double than the previous, you know, southbound flow. With that, you know, I understand Dr. Wei, you do have a lot of insight on China and Asia Pacific market. Can you add a little bit to the, that question, you know, regarding, you know, what are the clear signal and how can the market performance being tracked in this volatile environment? Um, I think that's a very good question to kick off. In terms of measuring market performance, obviously, you know, um, we are providing, um, you know, a great number of indexes in tracking market performances uh, mm -hmm. within MSCI. So if you look at the index performance, uh, for example, in the first half of this year, we've been saying very clearly that, um, you know, for the Asia market, China market in general, it's been leading emerging markets. Um, mm -hmm. in terms of performance. And uh, there has been greater volatilities in developed markets, uh, particularly first in Europe and, and then, you know, um, in, in a lot of American countries uh, and the markets. And overall, uh, U.S. is still leading the um, uh, developed markets in terms of performance. But that's largely driven by technology search sector and, and NASDAQ. If you're looking across the market year to date, you know, um, I think it's pretty much in single note that um, that's the capital flow tilting towards the Eastern Asian markets and countries. I think in terms of number, number of single note to watch, uh, in terms of uh, how to position the firms uh, in this crisis and, and, and portfolio, I think the number of areas need to be watched, right? Mm -hmm. The first factor is obviously the China factor, right? Uh, obviously, talking about China factor, China has been first into this crisis and first out. Mm -hmm. And the implication to the global supply chain and market sentiments have been uh, you know, very, um, uh, very big. Uh, for example, uh, right now, obviously China is um, in under significant recovery uh, trajectory and that you know, um, rising su supply chain activities um, is crucial to global recovery. So the second point I want to uh, think about is ba basically the global development of this pandemic. And, and as you know, different countries, regions in different recovery or in a, in, even outbreak uh, stage. Um, so overall, um, how, how this overall COVID will develop, uh, especially right now, it's outbreak in South uh, Americas, um, in, in some of the bigger countries like India, how mm -hmm. that may bring this global healthcare um, um, a system and the capability to deal with it politically, you know, economically, that's very important signal. The third signal I would watch is, uh, is about the market uh, and style um, transitions, right? So, so again, 
we've been observing um, some of the kind of dis dislocations. Um, um, for example, in, in the US listed technology se sectors, um, it is very interesting to see, you know, um, that kind of reversion or alignment to fundamentals, may, how that may have an impact to the styles of the market investment. Uh, a fourth and fifth indicator I will watch uh, is on capital flows, is basically the trend of US dollar and how this geopolitics uh, development may impact a key macro signals like US dollar, you know, interest rate, as well as you know, the commodity prices. Uh, as you know, the US dollar has been weak recently, um, but it's going to be a key uh, signal to watch, especially leading up to the US election. I would like just to add uh, some of the initial observation here and obviously you know, adding on more details later. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wei. So basically, the China factor, some, you know, uh, market factors as well as capital flow. And um, Ancio, you know, I think, you know, um, part of the question is the gap between the market performance and real reality. You know, interestingly, I had dinner with my, you know, um, six-year-old friend long time ago, and then he just called me up and then say, hey, he, lo he lost his job, but he's making a good chunk of money by trading te Tesla and other names. So can you shed some lights on how uh, detached between the kind of like real economy and, uh, you know, share market price we are seeing in the emerging market, you know, briefly? Well, I can only really talk G20 and China these days. Um, G20 totally detached. There's no semblance of, of any um, connection between the economic realities we all know and the stock markets because the, in, indeed also what the analysts are saying that the earnings aren't, aren't justifying the valuations. But with China, there is a very clear story, which is a very clear story of economic recovery, which is really based on two things. One, Keynes still works in China. He doesn't work in the US or the Germany or the UK or anywhere else because nobody's going to go and wear a, a sombrero and don um, some jeans and, and dig a ditch and build a road. In China, they will still do so. That means that the money stays in China and the people spend the money in China. The second thing is equally important that the, that the economic policy in China is so much more visionary and holistic compared to this row vote that the Western G20 politicians are trying to row using toothpicks namely monetary and fiscal policy, which is just a dead horse. It doesn't work anymore. That game is over with. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Very insightful. So no more helicopters. So um, maybe we can shift gear a little bit to Sergio. I understand you do have, you know, deep experience on the Brazilian market. And since the topic is emerging market and, you know, Brazil is an important part, can you add some like or observation on comment on the, you know, signals and, you know, market situation? Thank you. When I comment about the impacts of the pandemic in the Brazilian equity markets, I like to start with interest rates. In Brazil, we are living the lowest interest rate ever. And what does it mean? It means that institutional and individual investors, they've been stimulated to look for better allocations for their investments. And equities and equity derivatives has been a choice. This is visible in the daily volumes at the exchange. And this is also visible that individual investors, they are getting far more sophisticated. And it is not only a phenomenon in Brazil. You see this happening even in the US, the growing number of individual investors in Asia. And this is something that's coming to stay. In turn, in Brazil, this phenomenon is creating opportunity for new issues and follow-ons. So this year, we are having a significant number of IPOs and follow-ons. And again, this is a cycle which is going to attract more international investors for our platform. And with this uh, environment, we believe that we will continue creating paths to diversify and evolve for more sophisticated instruments. Got it, agree. I think in a low rate environment, it's all about growth, you know, with the record IPO in Brazil, I think that is 
going to attract a lot of you know global capital to the market looking for growth or opportunity and that brings me to the second question um, which is you know indices are moving on you know news news of a stimulus package around the globe but will the stimulus package you know be enough to restart the economies or will they cause a false start that will lead to a global recession? Maybe Dr. Wei, can you, you know, start by sharing your view on that? I think we, we can take this question by comparing the current situation to 2008 mm -hmm. financial crisis, um, where it's basically leading by some of the systematic issues um, in, in the banking and financial sector. Whereas this around is basically an external shock and leading to, you know, totally, um, you know, disruption of people's behavior, right? The, the, the behavior they, they you know, yeah. go up, they consume, et cetera. So we are talking a very different paradigm of, of, of you know, whether it's demand-related shock or supply-related shock. It mm -hmm. is easier to supply money in 2008 to rejuvenate the consumption and supply of goods in 2008 time of scenario versus now yeah. is the utmost important to you know to 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 to, to basically putting things under control right um, and largely you know um and and getting people um, confidence uh, rising to the level of a pre-covid situation we see that kind of happening in some countries especially china um mm -hmm. where we see you know obviously now the greater focus on um you know the virtuous kind of consumption loop in, inside china um, but we, we didn't see that largely outside of China as yet, mm -hmm. uh, even though there is a mass stimulus. So we could question um, that, um, uh, you know, how, how the different stimulus package really flow into the real economy. The second point I want to make is basically, if you're looking at the, um, the market shocks so far, we have the first shock, right, global yeah. shock um, in March. But, you know, after saying second wave, third wave or fourth wave in different countries, we may are, you know, we are still yet to see the second market shock, which could yeah. potentially be a, you know, significant risk factor to watch out um, and a, a big uncertainty for the next, you know, six, 12 months. Uh, the biggest implication of that is how we evaluate the impairment of this COVID to the balance sheet of the different governments and household alike. Right. So mm. that exercise haven't been carried out um, and, um, you know, the, the uncertainty can only be released once different governments can be coordinated to find, um, uh, you know, resolution to the current um, um, the crisis. Got it. Thanks. I'm doing my part. You know, I'm actually, my wife and I has been online shopping a lot, even my daughter. Oh. And my portfolio net exposure is very high, you know. Asia's and China. And uh, Ansio, can you um, add a little bit on this question? You touch a bit on the physical and monetary policy, but do you think those are enough to, you know, quick uh, to restart the economy in general? They can't by definition because we're dealing in time series analysis with a structural trend problem, not mm -hmm. with a cyclical problem. I think that many people have been talking about V. Um, as a V-shaped recovery, I call it V the, for V for vaporize, and L is what I think was going into with Jap like Japan, which I used to cover for many years for Smith Newcourt, um, that it's going to be a, a long, deep, a long, no-go anywhere recession. And that's again because we're rowing, we're trying to row about with toothpicks, with old techniques that simply don't work, except the only country that I can pretend to know a little bit about outside of in, in the emerging markets would be China, where the people are still willing to do the work, the Keynesian idea of the stimulus, okay? So mm -hmm. um, I think it's very much this academic confusion of what, talking about a cyclical recovery when we're dealing with a structural mess, that the chickens have come home to roost. And secondly, that, we, um, that the tools that we're using simply cannot, by definition, then help with the G20 to get things going again. Yeah, I think that concludes on the first part discussed about the market in general. I think the panel has discussed we are seeing 
a uh, super strong sentiment, you know, um, from Kevin, you know, Hong Kong Stock Exchange and also regionally. In Brazil, we are seeing, you know, IPO really in a record level and a lot of, a lot of growth. But at the same time, from a strategy's perspective, we are seeing, you know, a v, V-shaped vaporize, you know, not enough yeah. stimulus to, to kick back, you know, the economy. But China pot consumption has been quite strong. That brings us to the second topic, which is the tools and methodologies for the investor to implement strategy and to manage risk and challenges. Um, the third question I have, you know, is with board valuation difference and fundamental expected to impact returns, you know, what should active manager to be doing to outperform market? Um, you know, Dr. Wei, I think this is an obvious question for you because you got a big market share, you know, on those, you know, ETF and index related products. I'm very happy to share some initial thoughts, right? So first of all, obviously, as we see a market volatility in the first half of this year and year to date, uh, we see a lot of dispersions across single, single stock names, across markets, across even factor styles, and across different investment strategy types. Those dispersions actually offer excellent opportunities for active investors if they are well positioned and have the right tool to deal with it, right? So the second point I want to make is really this crisis so far has shown the benefit of global diversification, right? And, you know, some people, even though they are starting to think about um, deglobalization or home market investment, in fact, you know, this type of crisis is shown that it can only be dealt with, only with globally, um, you know, well uh, coordinated uh, across different nations, different markets. Uh, one, you know, only your portfolio can be diversified um, if, if you have enough exposure to deal with you know, different nature of the supply chain. That's actually a big lesson for, for many of the investors. The third yeah. lesson I would say is um, people may not be realized that during such time, managing the so-called factors could be even important than managing single stocks, right? I would call it their, the diverse factor dis- performance uh, during this period of time, leading by momentum and growth, um, you know, on, on a positive performance side, and obviously we see value and size on the performed. So if you are well positioned or well equipped to manage those factor exposures, your performance of the active um, managed portfolio can be greatly enhanced. And the, 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 the last lesson we learned is basically we see a number of emerging trends in terms of the, uh, how people would active manage portfolio. One trend is basically on sustainable investing or the ESG type of investing. Mm-hmm where we see throughout the crisis, ESG have demonstrated itself as a differentiating factor. Some of the underlying rationale is people starting to recognize, right, the importance of the socially, um, uh, you know, importance in managing some uh, some of the, um, you know, social aspect of things, you know, maintaining human capital, maintaining, you know, social norms uh, throughout the crisis. As, you know, on the other hand, the importance of environmental and governance uh, metrics has been, um, you know, been greatly recognized. The other emerging trends we've seen is basically the thematic investing. A lot of you have probably heard about a lot of, you know, those, uh, you know, so-called online versus offline type of uh, performance dispersions, but that's essentially true, right? We, the COVID, one lesson is, is accelerated this, um, you know, next generation of technology transformations. Yeah, actually, uh, those are very great points. And um, as you might understand, we also manage one of the largest, you know, fund of fund in China. This year, actually, is a good kind of like for active manager. In terms of sector performance, we are seeing year to day, the new economy versus old economy sector performance is as high as 100%. In terms of Q2 earnings, you know, the good one and then the bad one, the difference is 50%. So for active stock picker, I think it's also a good paradise for them to stop, you know, picking as well. And Kelvin, can you, do you have anything extra to share on, you know, question number three? What are the, you know, what should the active manager be doing to outperform the market? I think I can um, concur really with everything we're saying. I think the um, the one thing that we've seen um, this year um, when you dissect the, the 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 huge inflow that we've seen through our Stock Connect model into China um, yep. from Western asset managers, um, you used to look back maybe two three years ago and it'd be pretty even between um, Shenzhen and Shanghai. 
But certainly this year, there's at least a third more, if not more, going into the Shenzhen stock. So that would sort of um, back up what you're saying there, William. I think, as we all know, Shenzhen is uh, is much more tech orientated, new economy orientated, and and Shanghai typically the sort of old banks, if you will, or old economy, or um, they might not thank me for positioning it that way. So let's just say established economy. Um, and and that's the thing. The the other thing I've noticed. Um, Clearly, that um, that uh, is, is maybe a, a, a telling sign is um, we often look at index levels and uh, and whatnot, but also the percentage of retail participation has been um, absolutely exemplified this year, and that's sort of a lot of sentiment-driven trading, as you will, plus the fact that folks working from home and whatnot. But um, if you actually bring this down into actual assets. Um, then another signal that we sort of look at as a concurring indicator is, uh, and not many people tend to look at this, but is the actual assets that are being held um, in terms of a notional amount or assets under custody, some people might say. Um, that, that amount into China by foreigners has, um, has actually doubled with a, with a, with a um, certain weighting towards that, that tech index, uh, tech sector uh, or new economy sector. Um, so that that's been really interesting, and the and then again the the record inflows from Westerners into into Hong Kong itself has been again yet another record year. So um, I would also concur with uh, with Dr. Wei, um, ESG um, becoming very thematic. Um, particularly, we notice the um, U.S. investors are um, are very very. Um, uh, determined to to get a lot of ESG information and do a lot of screening around that. Um, we haven't seen it necessarily be at the same intensity that it is in the US yet, um, but uh, it's definitely coming. And I'm sure Dr. Wei as well is getting daily questions on this and how we're going to uh, ensure that um, our markets are uh, are dovetailed into the investors' needs around the world for ESG. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Kevin. You haven't touched the COVID beer question yet. We'll save it. Uh, later. COVID, yeah. And then, uh, maybe that maybe yeah. we'll run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> the the next off. question is, you know, <laughs> again, the second topic is about tools and methodology. We can implement those trade. We we're seeing, you know, strong sentiment, you know, repeatedly during the panel. And um, from the stock exchange and in this index solution provider perspective, you know, what are the best tools for investors to implement them? investment strategy in this volatile situation. And I would like to address this question to Sergio, you know, how would you advise, you know, market participant in general in participating, maybe the Brazil market or other emerging market if they want to play the volatile market environment? Yeah, is that good question? From the exchange point of view, the best tools for investors to implement their trading strategies are based on two pillars, risk management and a good offering diversified products. When you put these two together, it is definitely, it is easy for investors to trade orderly. Doesn't matter if it is emerging or developed markets, but it is important to have this diversified ecosystem also, which you can attract local investors, local asset managers, local banks, local pension funds, and then in turn, you create a flow very attractive to come the international investors. This is key for uh, emerging markets. And talking about diversification, this is a gradual process, which starts with the fixed income, the equity market, the equity derivatives, and then you can go for other level with the deposited receipts, ETFs. So it's quite advanced. But I can see clearly that emerging markets, they are going this direction. You can see Asian uh, market infrastructure offering a big size, big number of ETFs. In Brazil, we we are catching up in the ETF markets and definitely in the DR markets. The DR markets in Brazil, we're going to reach a number of over 550 DRs listed in Brazil, mixing European companies, North American companies, and Asian companies. So we we see that this diversification has been allowing local investors to to be more creative and take advantage of a diversified portfolio at the moment. 
Thank you, Sergio. And Enzo, what are you advising your clients in doing? Um, what kind of tools are you using? You know, exchange listed and other tools to implement their trade aim the volatile environment? I'm a great believer in the ETFs, frankly, because we having advised fund CIOs for years and years, it's, it's just, it's very difficult to be consistently right. We all know that. That's part of the skill. I think that ETFs have a lot going for them. Of course, not an ETF is not an ETF. So one has to be very careful how one picks these ETFs. Um, I'm having come from very much from the bond world. I believe actually that high dividend yielding utility stocks and consumer staples with sustainable dividend yields are really a very good replacement to the um, bonds that, because a 4% yield on a bond is very, very risky, but the 4% dividend yield on a utility is actually quite a good, is, a, is a quite a solid number to, to aspire to. And uh, Dr. Wei or Kevin, do you have any quest, uh, any you know, um, comments or, or you know, ideas oh, yeah. on this kind of two? Yeah, I do, I do, if I may. Um, Look, I think, I think you've got to go back to the start of your question. Um, when you say market participant, it's really what type of market participant yeah. are you? Um, yeah. It's very important. So I think it's, um, you know, if you're, if you're a passive manager, then obviously index is, uh, is key. Um, we see more and more long onlys uh, actually taking futures positions on that, on that passive flow now. So, um, yeah. and then backing into sort of, um, as uh, Professor Enzio was mentioning, um, you know, the, the ETF is obviously playing into that ecosystem. Yeah. But what if you're an outright hedge fund, long short hedge fund, then um, or if you're a vol player, if you're um, a high net worth individual, they're very different participant and you need many different things. Vol will probably lead you to think to options when you're talking about volatility. And, and then if you're sort of trying to play that on a high net worth individual basis, you probably want a structured product around that. And so um, the, the very different um, uh, ecosystem that you need, but um and also if you're a quant fund or with all these wonderful data signals out there, you know, you need to be able to adjust and that's probably typically expressed through, through borrow and swaps as well as, as well as futures and, um, and sometimes options. But I suppose the point I'm trying to make here, what is important is the chemical reactions between them all. Um, and it's very important that you have a strong cash equities. It's very important that you have a strong futures, uh, strong options and, um, and, uh, and percolating itself into the structured products that can be derived off the back of that. So I would say there's not one silver bullet here, William. And uh, you know, exchange, um, we're all growing up to, you're going to have to offer everything because they're all interlinked. Yep, makes sense to me. And um, thanks, Kevin. Yeah. And Dr. Way, to conclude for the part two, which is the tools and methodology, do you have anything to share with you know, the audience on the best tools from your perspective? Um, uh, actually, very quickly from my side, from index provider's perspective, right, the, the tools and services are separate from the uh, index product, right? So we provide index for a wide uh, variety of use cases for our mm -hmm. clients whether it's, you know, creation of financial products uh, with exchanges like ETFs and index futures and options, or, you know, it's basically working with asset managers to launch actively benchmark uh, funds, uh, you know, mutual funds uh, or institutional funds, uh, or with, you know, even working with asset owners to create se separate manage mandates internally, externally, right? We provide essential tools um, in that all of that in investment ecosystem and process. So, mm -hmm. so very quickly observation that, you know, over the past one to two years, we do observe quite um, strong demand for the new innovations, right? In a number of areas, particularly I would like to highlight the, the high demand in ESG, the high demand in thematic, and, and the high demand in fixed income as well as China related, um, uh, you know, uh, the indexes. Yep. So, for example, the ESG, obviously, as I earlier uh, mentioned, is a very fast-growing field where, you know, taking the ETF, listed ETF markets, um, the, you know, among the top 10 ETF, um, you know, nine of them are, are based on MSCI flagship ETF indexes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we talk about money flows, for, for example, previously. What we're observing is year-to-date, uh, MSCI's, um, you know, based um, ESG ETF have been um, shown to, um, to, yep. to to have around 90% of market share in terms of flows. Mm -hmm. So I'm just highlighting some of the trends we serve broadly 
And, and obviously, you know, given time constraints, I won't delve much deeper into other topics um, for, for this yep. question. Thank you, Dr. Wei. Actually, you touched a little bit on our third main topic, which is the product innovation. You mentioned about ESG thematic, you know, and the options and other, you know, derivative as well. So um, with the renewed focus on technology and implementing asset allocation, we would like to talk about the latest trend on in terms of product innovation. And Kelvin, um, can you share a little bit more, you know, from your perspective, what, what is the latest trend as an exchange? Are you seeing, you know, maybe the market participant are implementing their trade, you know, in the market in terms of new tools, new product side? Yeah, certainly. I think, um, you know, the world is probably very aware at the moment. We're, uh, we're very focused on uh, making a success out of our, our MSCI suite that uh, we launched here just a couple of months ago. It's a very uh, long term relationship that we've entered into. So at the moment, it's uh, a lot of time is being spent um, to, to ensure that the, uh, the platform is a Rolls Royce platform to ensure the longer term growth there. Um, and, uh, and then we can welcome in um, not just the platform that everybody else in the world seems to have, but also something that is a wonderful mousetrap for the Chinese as they like to go, as they want to go global, um, hopefully in the not too distant future. I think outside of that, um, we clearly see um, the, the tech, the tech, um, the tech uh, flavor at the moment. Uh, have announced um, the Hang Seng Tech Index, uh, which clearly will um, will look to do um, to do uh, derivatives on fairly shortly. Cannot uh, put a date on that at this moment, um, but again, as I said earlier, everything uh, interacts with each other. So you can see clearly where HS Tech could have some synergy with um, with the Taiwan Index that uh, MSCI produced, for example, where uh, semiconductor is a big flavor there. Um, yep. So you can see the these symbiosis uh, um, type of relationships um, that are occurring. Um, hedging tools for China will always be the, uh, the big interest in the market subject to regulatory interest for us. Um, and then finally, the other, the other trends, um, we're seeing um, sort of what I call the bookends um, in terms of uh, dated and so um, there's been a, a stress for uh, longer dated uh, uh, derivatives, um, particularly for, uh, for structured products wanting to go out five years. Um, at, the same, at the same time, um, you want event-driven products, so weekly, weekly index options, for example. So um, you hear a, a news about a, a new vaccine that's coming out tomorrow, um, you certainly want to be able to react to that. And so, um, so the shorter duration and the longer term is, uh, is sort of a departure from the old monthly, quarterly type of uh, approach to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to index derivatives. Makes sense. All those make the you know secondary market a more efficient place, you know, for different market participants to express or hedge their view. And um, Sergio, can very, you very hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sergio, can you add a little bit? You know, you touched earlier on, and the first part that you know you are seeing huge IPO and capital flow to the Brazil market. Are you seeing any latest trend in terms of you know product innovation in the emerging market? Yeah. Uh, in terms of trends and future outlook, in my opinion, it looks pretty exciting because the pandemic accelerated situations that we thought would happen 10, 15 years ahead. Investors are definitely looking for opportunities beyond border. And the response for market infrastructure has been very agile. Uh, and this uh, is creating more opportunities for investors. An investor sitting in London or in New York today can easily uh, invest in Brazil, India, China, Thailand. So it, it, it's really open as much as they want to diversify and take advantage of opportunities in the global markets. Technology is key. And I'm confident that market infrastructures, they will continuously improving their technology to make easier the access to international investors. And this is key. Without a good technology and standardized contracts or products, 
that also facilitate the strategies for global investors. So this is, in my opinion, a future outlook that has already started. It's happening now. And I can only see this trend growing. Dr. Wei, do you have anything to add? You touched a bit on the innovation earlier on ETF and um, you know, ESG and other initiatives, please. Yeah, I, I very quickly to highlight, um, in addition to ESG, we see actually a lot of interest on actually a diversified trends of themes, right? Beyond the technology focus, we okay. see, you know, some kind of subcomponents of technology that matter materials in future of life and work. For example, the smart cities, um, you know, the future mobilities, um, and the, you know, the genomics, right? Um, and, um, and, you know, different ways to reshape the, you know, the, 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 the artificial type of uh, futures. These are really attract a lot of investment um, uh, interest. In China, we see beyond technology, we see, you know, the themes like rising consumers is really important uh, to different segments of consumers, including millennials, you know, the older generations, like including, you know, shift, shifting demographics. So these are all the important trends. Um, at, above and beyond all, you know, the different pillars of uh, investment trends, we see a great trend in the customization of those index um, uh, to create a bespoke uh, investment solutions, ranging from asset owners to managers alike, right? So this customization, I think, it's, is, a, is a great demonstration of people want to, you know, um, design strategies that best fits their investment objectives and constraints. Um, you know, um, in the context of COVID, probably I mentioned about, there is a lot of re-emphasize on the social elements um, of, of, of things, right, uh, related to human, you know, uh, yeah. the health. And uh, you know diversity, etc. Right. So these are reinforced uh, throughout the COVID and some of the um, events happening globally. Thank you, Dr. Wei. Customized index, very, really inter interesting. We have about five minutes to go. You know, uh, before we Q and A, and you know, time flies. And uh, I think um, that brings us to the last question. I would like you know to each of the panelists to kind of like summing up your final thoughts as well as you discuss. You know, any particular, you know, investment trend or product trend that you want to share, you know, with the market participant. So maybe we can, you know, start with again, Kevin, you know. Yeah, thanks, uh, William. Um, well, clearly, I think um, I've probably laid out the stool quite strongly that um, I think the uh, direction of travel for emerging markets is, uh, is certainly east to west um, and probably east to east as well. Um, so I think that's... Um, if you think of the MSCI inclusion, really at 20% of its potential for China, um, we've got a, a hell of a journey to go on at the moment. It's, it's incredibly exciting. Um, in terms of um, future trends, um, I would certainly look towards um, uh, data and um, the way that data is being consumed um, by investors, particularly quant funds now, is probably um, something that's going to dramatically change our markets over perhaps short to medium term and and really what we're seeing is because of the more online purchases um, the more payments by phones um, that you're seeing what that means is you've got more data and what that therefore means is you've got more certainty in what the earnings of companies are going to be um, so the models that we've lived with for the past decades of uh, analyst uh, predictions and estimates and then announcements of earnings announcements and then market reaction will probably be a little bit more real time and it's going to lead me to what I said earlier I think uh, products that are and the ecosystems that exchanges do around event-driven products or short-duration products is going to become increasingly more important. And, uh, you know, waiting for uh, quarterly rolls, for example, might be a bit nonsensical when we sort of got a full exact number of quarter data for that company and that yep. set of companies. Yeah, make perfect sense. In terms of quant, actually, in the domestic China Asia market, the quant hedge fund in terms of AUM has grown tremendously, you know, in the past mm -hmm. year or so. I think, you know, the trend Absolutely. is definitely happening. And uh, yeah. Sergio, can, can you also share your final thoughts and trend uh, with the audience? My last contribution to the panel 
and to the audience couldn't be different. I would like to mention uh, ESG. So it, it is visible how the industry has been working in many areas to, to create guidelines, to educate companies, to educate investors about the ESG and how a sustainable and responsible investment approach will be beneficial for all of us decades and generations ahead. So this is my last contribution to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. And, um, you know, market is full of uncertainty. Instead of the normal agenda going to Dr. Wade, I'll pinpoint Enzo first. And Dr. Wade, you take the last one, okay? All right. Um, first, I have four conclusions. One is there's no quick policy fix to things that have been neglected for decades at middle-class education, structural changes to the economy, the chickens are coming home to roost. We're trying to row a boat using toothpicks by using monetary and fiscal policy in the G20. And that means that the G20 are literally going to go to L, or literally meaning that they're just going to flatten out like Japan for many, many years to come. My picks are China because Keynes works in China because there's a visionary policy and the tech sector in general. The new paradigm is, of course, that the, the, the tail is going to wag the dog. In other words, the technical side of things, the technology is going to be running human feelings. In my day at trading desks at Smith New Court at Warburg's, and at Schroeder's and Morgan Guarantee, it was always human beings who ran the markets. Now it's going to be tech running human beings. Hmm. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Wei, over to you. Sure, I think I would like to pick up some keywords uh, for, for the um, uh, panelists have been shared. First of all, data and technology, right? So I would like to emphasize that a lot of firms is going to emphasize a lot more on data and technology. For example, at MACI, we recently formed a partnership with Microsoft, essentially thinking about more broadly how to utilize the future of data and technology um, in the whole eco, you know, system and investment process of how we deliver and how we store things um, uh, for the future. Um, and and, and I, I think, think secondly, the COVID have um, basically haven't wrap up and essentially if you look in the future a number of things might happen right so first of all people will be rethinking the future of work and life essentially um you know the covid have demonstrated vulnerability of number of things right first of all you know life and health and secondly you know the global supply chain and obviously these different points will, will see self-organization after yeah. the covid which will lead into you know, some of the, um, you know, or accelerate some of the trends already seen, right? So lastly, I think, uh, you know, I pick it up on the uh, fiscal stimulus um, side where, you know, a lot of nations are considering fiscal stimulus. They have a choice between the kind of legacy or the old um, type of, um, um, you know, infrastructure relying on a lot of uh, fossil fuels, right, the, the oil and gas, or the new generation infrastructure, which is greener, you know, uh, focus on renewables. Um, and, um, and, and obviously choices, actually, we are going to see a lot of more green related stim stimulus, and that will de define many of the future of the work, technology, and, um, you know, uh, real infrastructure. Thank you, Dr. Wei. Yeah, and I, I think that is, you know, um, I'm trying to conclude the first part of the panel uh, before the QA. And again, you know, the topic today is equities, hopes of economic recovery and stimulus. And talking to the panelists, I do see hopes and, you know, stimulus and a lot of tools, you know, actually, you know, coming down the road. Um, we talk about, you know, um, the first part, market. I think the key kind of like conclusion everyone agree, agree is the consensus is the sentiment has been very strong as mentioned by Kelvin and, you know, Dr. Wade. And in terms of tools, we're actually seeing a lot of, you know, ESG, ETF, you know, new options, custom-made index, that type of tools in order to reflect, you know, the stronger stimulus. In terms of future trend, I think we talk about the data, the quant fund, you know, and potentially, you know, more market participants getting to the emerging market to particip participate in the long-term growth.
involved. And um, personally, I think the best signal is when I see, you know, Kevin, you take away your, you know, COVID beard. That means we are away from the COVID situation and, you know, the market will continue to go up. So um, thank you so much for everyone. Uh, this is the first part of the panel and we'll have, a, you know, 10 to 15 minutes Q&A session. Thank you. Well, what a fantastic session that was to end with. Uh, it's been an amazing trading age of 2020. Uh, we are very lucky to have some of the panelists uh, being able to join us today and, and to answer some of our questions. Um, I'll just get straight into it. What uh, would you please share more about the China story, such as China Chinese equity market outlook for the next six to 12 months in terms of capital inflow and outflow? That's an open question to anyone. Yeah, Dr. Wei, do you want to take it? You're China expert number one. Well, you know, we, we don't have a kind of house view on those forward-looking capital flows. Uh, we are index company, right? We don't manage assets. But, you know, personally, I would think, given the strong kind of robust inflows we have observed this year, basically year-to-date, uh, U.S. dollar, 20 billion U.S. dollars um, to the North Bond, um, um, especially amid this COVID crisis. Um, so, so you know, that's actually set a very robust tone uh, for, for investors' um, uh, appetite. And we've been seeing recently uh, quite a number of investors have, you know, started to discuss um, this so-called dedicated China allocation. And that by itself could be a significant driver for the next round of inflows. I'm William. Yep. Uh, I'll add a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a China expert number two here. And um, on the in terms of southbound, actually we are seeing strong demand, you know, from retail and institutional investor in the, you know, Hong Kong listed Chinese company. And there are a couple of, you know, big IPO coming in town in the, you know, uh, next week or so. The main reason is um, Chinese investors are looking for diversification of their core holdings because historically it's concentrated in a couple of, you know, stocks, just like the white wine, you know, liquor makers or the sector. The more new economy type of sector, you know, listing in Hong Kong will enable the domestic Chinese investor to diversify their equity exposure in terms of sectors. And the second point is in terms of North Mount uh, kind of flow, despite it's not as strong as the previous few years, but we are still seeing interest from global investors in investing in the China Asia market. The main reason is in the low rate environment, um, actually investors are looking for growth and diversification to rest of the world, you know, exposure. And in particular, domestic China consumption and the new, you know, deal, you know, um, in, internal circulation type of policy. So in short, we remain positive on the domestic China Asia market and Hong Kong market in the next six to twelve months. Thank you. Yeah, maybe um, William, if I can, if I can add as well, it's Kevin from Hong Kong Exchange. I think, um, I think actually this year we've seen um, record uh, inflow into Asia market through the Northbound Stock Connect, and uh, in fact today was our sixth largest on record, and that was uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Weber, due to a FTSE rebalancing. Um, I think our holdings on uh, assets under custody that we're holding now has gone up dramatically, uh, particularly from Western investors, uh, U.S. investor, um, nudging now to two trillion renminbi. Um, just a blink in an eye, that's gone from one to 1.5 to two, quite quite quickly in 12 months. Um, so um, the other the other thing that we see uh, is also records for inflow into uh, Chinese bond market as well through uh, through Bond Connect. Um, nudging on uh, 30 billion of uh, ADT that's going through on that. Um, and the other observation, I think, is also the, uh, um, the, the IPO, the coming home, if you will, that we're seeing. Um, uh, Alibaba being probably the headline for that, followed by uh, JD, Nedis, uh, marrying up with Meizuan, Xiaomi. These are all our top stock and top holding every day. Um, global percentage of Alibaba now is uh, starting to clearly come from west to east. Um, we see the conversion trade uh, on daily basis now. So um, uh, it's gaining a lot, a lot of momentum. And then finally, I think um, we see uh, looking into the lens of uh, Chinese healthcare, already the uh, 
the second largest um, uh, biotech sector, if you will, in the, in the world now. Um, and we're really just at the beginning because, uh, you know, the big index, the MSCI Emerging Market Index, is uh, is really only at uh, 20% of its potential. So uh, you can imagine over the coming years that uh, as that uh, increases its weighting um, to, to its 100%, then uh, we're going to see a dramatic increase of, uh, of inflow into China. I'll move on to the uh, next question then, which again I've, I've seen a lot about. But uh, what lessons can be learned from the rollout of short selling bans in Asia, which was like a, a big hot topic for a long time? Well, uh, I guess it's me again. <laughs> uh, look, I can't talk about the market, but um, you know, I personally lived through um, the uh, the short selling ban of uh, Lehman Brothers in in London, and it's. Uh, Look, I think the view is really let the let the market be a, a natural market to to the extent that you can. So um, I think that's clearly what we hear from uh, from investors and from market participant. Uh, markets should be as as natural as they can possibly be. So um, that's uh, that's generally the feedback that we 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 hear. After COVID nineteen, do you expect investors to shift more capital toward countries that are seen to have managed the pandemic better? Yeah, I think um, Kevin again. I think like I can only look at the data, right? And um, there seems to be a decent correlation between the uh, back to work or the factories opening back up in China and the the inflow that we see through uh, through Stock Connect again. So um, that is an indicator. I think is uh, is, a, is a decent correlation. So um, it does seem to be a, a leading indicator for uh, for, uh, for for global investors. So. Um, next one. With reduced Chinese outbound investment, will capital be redirected to the domestic market, intensifying competition for quality assets in China, particularly, particularly tier one cities? Yep, this is William. I'm happy to take this one. Um, I think, you know, um, actually liquidity has been very strong in the domestic China market. If you look at the number of, you know, um, brokerage account, actually it's close to 170 a million, 170 million number of accounts, which is historical peak, meaning that the interest on equity market is very strong. But at the same time, the growth of, you know, liquidity is high if you look at the M2 number. And um, besides the traditional, you know, property and uh, equity market and, you know, fixed income, we are seeing, you know, stronger demand for diversification of the equity holding exposure. That's why we believe the new launch of, you know, the Starboard or some other new IPO in the domestic market and Hong Kong Stock Exchange is actually a good way of absorbing those liquidity. And from a um, regulator or market participant perspective, we believe those capital would go into the capital expenditure of this, you know, high tech or, you know, capital intensive sector, which eventually would benefit the economy. So we believe this is a positive way or kind of like a good circle of uh, better use the excess liquidity in the system. Given that the U.S. markets for PE may become more attractive in the near future due to a likely drop in valuations alongside an increased in distressed asset opportunities, should we expect to see capital flows reduce in Asia Pacific? Well, uh, this is William. Uh, from my perspective, I I think the current uh, valuation on the private equity space in the U.S. and to a less extent globally are still expensive. You know, a lot of you know money is actually chasing the good deals, so I don't see uh, a very you know sharp correction on the private equity valuation. At least you know the deals that we are seeing. And secondly, I think you know in the long run, you know there is also. Uh, kind of like balance between liquid and illiquid assets. So from, from our client perspective, I believe their interest in investing globally um, has been increasing. But at the same time, as I mentioned earlier in the panel, I think some of the global investors are also worrying about the weakening of the U.S. dollar, which when people make global asset allocation, um, we have to take into consideration of the growth opportunity as well as um, the currency direction. Sergio, were you able to join? Yes, I'm on the line. Thank you. Ah, oh, fantastic. Um, so I've got a question for you. Um, because you you, you touched on a, on a bit of this, but someone's asked, um, what the Brazilian exchange is doing to encourage investment in in the Asian markets. Yes, thank you. Good question. So we first of all we are going to to open an office in Singapore very soon, 
And on top of that, uh, we, we are creating a suite of products, especially connectivity and thinking how to, to expose our market data for Asian uh, proprietary trading groups so that they can do their back tests and understand more and learn more about our market because we got to a point that now we have a good mix of products from cash, futures, options on equities, index options. So it's quite diversified what we can offer for sophisticated proprietary trading groups from Asia Pacific. We are already done. We are in a very good level with Europeans and North American uh, proprietary. And our challenge now is to attract more flow from Asia Pacific. Uh, would, would, would Asia inclu include Australia? Uh, because um, major Australian funds cutting their portfolio valuations, especially for retail, uh, do you expect this to, to occur in Brazil? Good question. Uh, at the moment, <laughs> when you talk about Asia, we are considering Australia, Singapore, China mainland, um, Hong Kong, Taiwan, India, Japan, and South Korea. So we, we are talking about eight, eight jurisdictions that we are going to, we, we've been developing our markets. Of course, uh, in the future, maybe we're going to grow to others that lo are looking very good, like Malaysia and Indonesia. But at the moment, these eight jurisdictions, and you are right, Australia is in the list. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so um, with that, uh, I think we're going to uh, finish up. Thank you for sharing your thought leadership. Take care. Bye-bye.